So the movie tells very well your journey from a climate skeptic to someone who's clearly uh, quite driven on this issue, from a nature photographer to a nice person. But about a year ago, it wasn't clear that this film was going to get made. So tell us how this, this came about. Well, it's more at the beginning of EIS, it wasn't at all clear that, that, there, that anything would come out of this. Uh, uh, Jeff's uh, and a couple other uh, cameramen went out in the field with us, Jeff Orlowski, uh, Jeff Orlowski the director, and the intention was to simply shoot B-roll for the sake of promotional and fundraising trailers, because this is a very expensive exercise to do, and we knew we ne needed video to help sell the story so that we could get the backing. And, uh, and they, that kind of went on for a while, and then Jeff peeled away and decided that he could possibly make his own, uh, his own uh, uh, feature film about it. And uh, he zigged and zagged on it for a time. And it wasn't until just about a year ago today, in fact, it was, it was this very week, a year ago, that uh, he, had, he, he got a phone call from the Sundance Film Festival saying, guess what? The film that you submitted got into Sundance, which is a huge, huge thing for American documentary films. You want to be seen there. And uh, so all of a sudden, the world changed. Once it got into Sundance, it premiered in the film festival circuit at Sundance in January, has been touring the world since then, and uh, now the theatrical release uh, that you're uh, part of just started uh, a week and a half ago in New York. So here we are. And has the film, do you know if the film has convinced any skeptics so far? People said, well, it's natural variation, or it's not happening. Has, has it converted people? Well, I, I think it has. Um, I, I know this from experience with just giving uh, public presentations and lectures even before the film started. I had uh, many, many situations where audiences were not um, uh, self-selected to be favorable to this subject. Um, and in fact, in many cases, were conservative and antagonistic. Um, and, and in all of those audiences, people would come up to me and say, thank you. I didn't understand what this was about, and your evidence really made me understand this. And what I think is so important is for people to understand this is not about belief. I, I just, it drives me crazy when people say, I believe or I don't believe in clim climate change. This is not about belief, because belief is ideology and doctrine and dogma. The, the problem with, with dealing with this issue in, in our country, especially right now, is that people are hung up on this as a question of ideology. But if people look at the facts as they've been accumulated by the scientific community and the facts as presented by the cameras, you can, you can look at the situation rationally and go, oh yeah, I understand. Now I know, now I think, using my rational brain, that there is something here that needs to be paid attention to. And you talked in your TED talk about merging art and science. And I think storytelling is part of that, because you've taken something that's very abstract, far away. I don't understand it. How does it relate to me? And you've made it visual, and you've made it a story, as well as art. Yeah, and I, I have to admit, I, I didn't set out with that conscious goal in mind. I, you know, it just organically grew out of the project to combine art and science. You know, I was just responding to the world as I saw it as a photographer, as a, as a guy who's traveled the world and has looked at these big environmental stories. I was just doing what I, what I knew how to do. And it occurred to me after about a year on, on the whole effort that we were harvesting the left and right sides of the human brain, that science was coming out of the left side and the art was coming out of the right side. And normally, people deal with a subject like this with one side or the other. But in the project, miraculously, we were using both sides of our, of our human mind, the bicameral mind, and we were fusing them and giving a, a, perhaps a, a deeper appreciation of the subject than you would get if you were just working from one hemisphere or the other. And one of the things you didn't touch on in the film, uh, you clearly said that it's a canary in a coal mine, that, this, that the shrinking glaciers are saying that something's happening. You didn't really touch on how the shrinking uh, glaciers actually can make the problem worse. Yeah, there's a big spiraling problem called Arctic amplification. And the, the, the more it warms in the Arctic, and the more, um, well, the more the atmosphere changes, the more the ocean currents change, the less sea ice there is, and the less, there, the less cooling there is in the northern latitudes. And that's, that's, a, that's a big issue, and it's accelerating. It's clearly accelerating.
And but some people would say it's not happening, or that you're in it for the money. That's one of the criticisms of uh, yeah. scientists, etc. Right. Right. Well, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, it just <laughs> simply is. There there is no money to speak of in this, and it's a constant struggle. You probably in fact, spent more money than you made. Believe me. The um, no. The, the the I'm often asked, what's the scariest part of this project? And it's definitely not crevasses and ropes. I'm actually quite concerned about uh, helicopters. I've had a number of near-death experiences in, in light aircraft, not just on this project, but on other ones. So I, I recognize how much the Russian roulette is maybe uh, not working in my favor right now. But, but more than any of those things, I worry about the finances. That has been the unrelenting grind of this project, the constant, constant you know, pressure to try and keep this thing uh, fueled and, and keep everybody fed and keep it going, but it is definitely not a profit-making enterprise. So where is the project going? Now that you've done this, what's, what's ahead for the Extreme Ice Survey? Well, we have 34 cameras on 16 glaciers right now, and uh, we will keep those cameras going indefinitely. We originally thought that it would be a three-year project. At three years, we realized five years would be a nicer, rounder number. And by about four and a half years, we realized that the weight of the historical record was so enormous that we couldn't stop at all, that we sort of had a, an obligation artistically and historically and culturally to just keep recording these changes indefinitely. So, so it's open-ended now. Um, I'm also hoping to uh, put some cameras in South America next year. It's always been a weak spot, I thought, that we didn't have the people in the funding to uh, make South America happen, but I think we can probably do it. About a year from now, we'll start that. And, uh, and I'm also looking at a broad range of other kinds of uh, anthropogenic impacts on the natural environment. And I've got a couple more really large projects coming down the chute right now. And speaking about anthropogenic impacts, this was made before Sandy. So tell us about how this is connected to Sandy or not. Well, it's, it's been incredible that this has come out during during this horrible uh, event of Sandy because it's obvious uh, Sandy has reanimated the uh, climate change conversation not just on the East Coast not just on the West but all across the country and in Europe I was amazed to uh, hear the uh, the uh, British talking about it so much this past week I did 15 interviews with BBC and um, the big newspapers there, and everybody was asking me about it, and they were they're very connected with it as well. So all of a sudden, these extreme weather events are making climate change much more real and meaningful to the global public. And it's not just about Hurricane Sandy; it's about the lest we forget the drought that we've been having most of the year in most of the continent, the extreme wildfire conditions, and this has been tending to happen year after year. It's been happening in Russia. It's been happening in Europe. There's been all sorts of crazy, outside-the-box weather. Uh, and and what, we're, what we have to remember is there's no one of these events that we can hang on climate change, but it's this overall pattern. The pattern is the big thing. It's pattern recognition here. Uh, we're recognizing a pattern exactly as it was predicted decades ago by the leading researchers in this field. People said um, as long as 100 years ago, that in a period of altering climate composition, we would have more active uh, weather cycles in the atmosphere. And we've been kind of waiting for those cycles to start to accumulate and appear with more regularity. Well, that appears to be what's happening with, with warming temperatures, with more violent storms, more violent floods, more droughts, um, more wildfires. It's all part of the same pattern. All this can be uh, depressing and paralyzing. So what have you done in your own life to try to reduce your carbon footprint? You're doing amazing work as a storyteller, uh, as a photographer. What have you done to reduce your own carbon footprint? You fly, you fly a lot. Yeah, I hate flying a lot. I really, honest to God, do. Uh, my own carbon footprint has been connected with, uh, with uh, solar panels on the roof uh, so that basically the electric demand of the house is all coming from the sun, or nearly all of it. Um, we check off that little box on our utility bill that says, yes, I want to support renewable energy. So whatever residual we have, it's coming from wind power. Um, I drive a hybrid car. I try and uh, minimize uh, travel as much as I can. I regret to say I still travel a lot. And I hope that uh, the powers that be up there in the heavens will forgive me for uh, my travel. But I hope that there's something useful that's coming out of it. Um, the biggest thing I think that we all need to focus on is that we each have 
skills and powers and capabilities and influence in the worlds around us that we can apply to this issue. The question always is, I see all these faces out here and everybody's saying, what can I do? I can't tell you what you can do. You know what skills you have. You know what spheres of influence you have. You know how you can bend the world around you to respond to this information. And what you have to do is look into your heart just the same way we did on our team and say, ah, okay, this is something that I can do with my skills. I'm a communicator. You're not all photographers and communicators, but you all have a way to reshape your families, your homes, your schools, your educational environments, your work environments, whatever it is, you can reshape your world. And bit by bit by bit, we can get there. There's no one single solution to this. There's no one magic bullet. There's no one person who can fix this. President Obama can't fix this by himself. This has to be a collective will of the people. And that, I know that sounds kind of populist, and I don't mean it like that, but I, I mean it genuinely that we all need to take a piece of this and move forward. Is that famous quote, do what you can with what you have where you are. Uh, our guest today at Climate One is author James Baylog, author of Ice, Portraits of the Vanishing Glaciers. He's also featured in the uh, feature film Chasing Ice. Uh, we'd like to invite your participation, and uh, there's the book. Yes. So uh, the loss of the glaciers is uh, an induced geologic event that we're in the middle of, and it's a Aside from an indicator of climate change, it's also potentially a huge aesthetic and spiritual loss for us all. So I'm curious to know what your particular thoughts as you've gone through this project are about what the nature of that aesthetic or spiritual loss is. How would you describe it? What particular are things that you surprised you that you wouldn't have thought of or we might not be thinking of? You know, I've, I've been a, a mountaineer for 40 years and a photographer of these kinds of things for almost, <laughs> almost as long. And um, I've been amazed to, to see how much beauty, how much magic has been revealed to me every time we go out to these landscapes. Um, it got to the point a few years ago where when I was packing my cameras to go back to Greenland, I was groaning inwardly thinking, oh my God, haven't I shot everything there is to photograph now? I mean, what can I possibly do on this next trip that I haven't done before? But every single trip has been a revelation. We see something new that we never imagined. And um, I, was, I was on BBC radio yesterday, and um, the, uh, one of the producers said to me when the show was done, she said, you know, when you describe all those emerald colors and the sapphire cover colors and the diamonds that you saw and the glittering, um, the, the glittering light at midnight, it sounds like you were closer to God. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I guess that's exactly right. You know, I, I don't think of myself as a religious person. I'm not a religious person, but there is something about these landscapes that takes you into another dimension. It, I mean, they really are otherworldly. They're not normal life as we know normal life here. And I feel incredibly lucky to have had those experiences and still have those experiences. Thank you for that question. Yes, right here. What are the chances of, or legal avenues that can be explored for bringing the fossil fuel industry to task for the problem that they're creating? There have been a lot of reports written about that. And uh, we would be here until tomorrow morning talking about it, even if I were a policy wonk, which I'm not. But there's, there are a lot of solutions to that issue. One of the biggest ones is, unfortunately, we have to adjust the market system to properly reflect the cost of carbon in our economy. Without those costs are externalized. And the, the system is rigged so that the cost of waste disposal in the atmosphere and all the impacts that come from free waste disposal in the atmosphere, those costs are not reflected in, in the price of the light bill and the price of the gas bill. It's as simple as that. And we have to buck up and recognize that those externalized costs have got to be paid for as we're using these energy sources. And right now, we've got this, this, this thing in our heads here in America that we can't, under any circumstances, absorb any more what are called taxes on our pocketbooks. And I don't know how we're going to get past that problem. I can't tell you that the solutions are easy, but it's somewhere in that nexus that we have to deal with this. 
And Bill McKibben, he was at Climate One two weeks ago. He's also putting pressure through shareholders, through universities, trying to put some work uh, pressure on oil companies. I got here today an electric car. Not everyone can afford them. You can lease a Nissan Leaf, other electric cars. It's still fossil fuels. It's not oil. Uh, there's lots of choices uh, out there for different uh, pocketbooks. Let's have our next question. I'm wondering about the pictures of the ice, and there's dirt on the ice and there's like rivers of dirt and I was wondering if that's pollution or if it's regular dirt. You talk a little bit in the movie about black carbon so. Hey, yeah, that's, uh, that, that stuff is called cryokinite and it's, it's shockingly soft when you touch it. It feels like talcum powder actually, wet talcum powder, which is to say you, you almost can't feel any grains in it. And it comes from um, uh, dust blowing in from Asia. It's dust blowing in from, uh, from river silt over in, in uh, central Canada. Um, it's also dust from coal-fired power plants, from uh, uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon exhaust from uh, diesel, and also from deforestation in the tropics, and from dung fires, you know, uh, animal waste fires in places like Southeast Asia and India. So that all just circulates around the world, and it's falling on us right now. Some of, the, some of those little carbon flakes are falling on us here in San Francisco. We don't see it, but the ice sees it because the ice is white, and it eventually gets worked around and accumulates in, in all those deposits. And yes, you find it in big deposits in the, bottom of, in the bottoms of some of those river channels. Welcome. Uh, have you captured uh, uh, on your, with your photographs any of the uh, glaciers that uh, are completely disappeared in the last few years? Or uh, are you planning to do that? Yeah, there's, there's a picture sequence in the book of a glacier in Bolivia called Chacoltaya, where um, there's, a, there's a, a mountain face up at 18,000 feet in the Andes uh, in Bolivia. And the, the whole mountain face was covered with ice in 1940 when the world's highest ski area was first built there. When I got to Chacoltaya in 2006, that ice had turned from being a glacier into a patch of snow not an awful lot bigger than this room. And over the next three years, that patch of ice went from being about 15 feet thick and about the size of this room, about the footprint of this room, to nothing. So we, we actually photographed the complete deglaciation of that, of that mountainside. And we have some similar things going on in some of our sites in the Alps, but it doesn't show up in the film. Thank you. Let's have our next question for James Balog. Okay. Over here. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Hi. I'm with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, which is, uh, as you may know, trying to get a revenue neutral, progressively rising fee on the carbon content of fuels and rebate all the money back to citizens. <clears throat> and that would send the market signal that we need. So we completely agree with both of you, and we thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. And at citizensclimate.org, if you log in, you can find out how you can be part of the process. Thanks. And I, I would underline that, it's, that those kinds of initiatives are incredibly, incredibly important because a lot of this national legislation historically has not come from the top down. It's come because there have been these kinds of legislative initiatives on the, on the local and state level. And uh, way back in the 60s, there was a hodgepodge of environmental laws across the United States, United States regulating air and water to the point where uh, Nixon and the, and the rest of the federal government, President Nixon and the rest of the government said, hey, we have to standardize these laws. And I think in, in having a state like California progressively pushing along, being advan in advance of a lot of the rest of the states, you're helping to lead the country. And eventually, these things will migrate up to the federal level and become standardized federal policy. And while California often talks about leadership, we've done a lot here, it's not done yet. There's still uh, suits against AB 32, the main climate law in California. So there's still some defense of laws that are already on the books that uh, needs to happen through public channels. Let's have our next question for James Balog. Um, yes. Very nice and impressive photography. I'm curious about the four glaciers that are growing up. Any reason, any theory regarding those glaciers growing up? I have no idea. Can't tell you. 
But I can tell you that uh, the vast majority of glacier, glaciers in the world are retreating, at least in uh, North America, South America, uh, Europe, Asia, Africa. You know, the vast majority are retreating. There are a few, a very few, that are stable or slightly advancing, but there's very little uh, positive change in the glaciers. And, and South America, particularly, is losing a tremendous amount of ice. But on average, in the, the glaciers in the world over the past 40 years, it would be as if you scraped off about a 40-foot thick section of ice from all these glaciers. Just took it all away. It's all out in the ocean now. And what happens if the Greenland ice sheet goes? Well, I don't think we're dealing with the question of the Greenland ice sheet going. I mean, that's a lot of meters of sea level rise. I think we're talking about small incremental changes for some time to come. But it's, it's really pretty much a, a foregone, con well, it's not a foregone conclusion, but it is a solid piece of quantitative evidence that we're going to be looking at easily two or three feet of sea level rise over this next century. And that's an awful lot more water along these low-lying coastlines. Yeah, um, Compared to, it's what, been seven inches the last, uh, it's what, about an inch a decade or something like that? It's, so it, it's, it's yeah. in, 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 incremental, exponential rate of change. Let's try to get one or two more questions in here for James Baylog, wherever the microphone is. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you have any prediction as to when we might have a national energy policy based on the interaction you've had with policymakers? None whatsoever. After they see this film. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we actually, uh, we have had a lot of interaction with, with Washington. I've presented this material on Capitol Hill. Uh, directly to the president's uh, science, uh, uh, energy and climate advisors. His science advisor has put a copy of the film on his desk. A number of his other top level staffers have put the film on the president's desk. But as I said, it's not his alone to deal with. We've got a legislative problem. So we've also put the film on the desk of every senator and congressman on Capitol Hill. Uh, I don't know if they watched it. I don't know if, what they thought if they watched it, but you know, we're doing what we can with the tools we have. Back to the theme of the film. Do what you can with the tools you have. And by the way, speaking of distribution, um, the film will be in theatrical circulation and the, it will stay in circulation longer if people come to see it. Then it goes on to National Geographic Channel in April for global TV distribution, including here in the US. We have an iPad app that will be coming out over the next few months. And uh, yes, DVD will be available next summer. We can't do it before then because of the TV deal. There's a very active Facebook page where you can go home tonight and let people know you saw this film. Uh, there's our next question. Yes. I want to first of all thank you for a spectacular presentation and very heartfelt. I hope everyone who hears this radio show comes to see this film. It's, it's magnificent. And I so appreciate your doing that. You mentioned in the film about uh, atmospheric changes, and I wondered if you could speak to that any further, such as changes in the composition of the air we're breathing. Yeah, I, I'm obsessed with this subject, and it's been growing since we shot those scenes in the film where I start, start talking about this being about air. That, that's where I think, in a way, we, uh, we've all made a, a, a perceptual mistake, and the climate community has made a communications mistake, a framing mistake. Climate is something that happens um, over a long time, and it's an accumulation of numbers, basically, and it's an accumulation of experience. Exper uh, patterns of experience, but air is something that we're all inhaling 15 to 20 times a minute all the time. It's the living substance. It's part of our lives all the time. And the core of this issue is about the air changing. The shift in the composition of that stuff we're breathing is profound. It's 40% different right now in terms of the carbon dioxide content than it was 100 years ago, probably 50 years ago. If you, if you tracked it, it would be pretty close to that. But it's 40% different than what it naturally is supposed to be. Now, maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe we can just absorb all that, the way we absorb the benzene that we inhale when we're at the gas pumps or whatever it is, you know? But I, somehow I don't think that's necessarily such a good thing. But I don't like the idea that the envelope of air that we have become accustomed to living in as a species for the past four million years 
is turning into something else. I don't think that's likely to be fundamentally good for us. Let's have one last question, wherever the mic is. Yep. Right here. Hi. <clears throat> hey, you mentioned the uh, Chasing Ipe app, and I actually noticed a couple days ago that the uh, app is actually out. So anyone who has an iPhone or iPad should absolutely download the Chasing Ice app. It's incredible, and I showed all my friends, and I think you should all show your friends too. I had one question. EIS I've, uh, you know, has been going on for a few years now. Do you know of other organizations who have started projects like EIS that are doing similar sort of time-lapse photography, or is it really just EIS? It's really just us. Um, there are some scientists that are on a, on a piecemeal basis. There's, a, there's a, some guys who were doing this you know, at a glacier here and a glacier there before us, and there have been a few more that have come on after us and actually clone, pretty much cloned the system. But uh, in terms of using this idea to look at uh, systemic environmental change, not really as far as I know. We've been looking at uh, uh, how beetle kill in the Rocky Mountains has been killing off the forests. So beetle kill is a consequence of climate change too. And we, we spent uh, a good bit of 2011 shooting that and got some incredible visuals that will be part of the next projects we're working on. So there's a lot of subjects to look at. I don't intend to necessarily strictly work with time lapse for the rest of my creative life, but it's a really important tool going forward. Um, there's one thing I'd like to mention before we forget. It's uh, around the question of what you can do. Out there at the back door as you leave, there's a little uh, cheat sheet that we've made up for you with um, some specific su suggestions for your own personal lives at home, but also some talking points that you can take away and use in those uh, those arguments, you just had Thanksgiving dinner yesterday. And I bet there were arguments at the Thanksgiving table in some cases. I know my wife had one with her parents back in Denver. Um, but uh, no, when Christmas dinner is coming up, and <laughs> you, you can use these as talking points, but the critical talking point is nature isn't natural anymore. This is not about natural variation. We're out beyond the realm of natural variation, and we spell it out on here. Our thanks to James Baylog for coming tonight. Thank you.